Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, the goal of today's webinar is to show you how you can make a uh, simulation of differential and common mode excitations in uh, uh, microwave uh, circuits of all types. Uh, so uh, I will start uh, briefly by uh, uh, showing you this example that I've picked. It's actually an example that we picked from a, a published paper. So this is, a, this is the actual structure. And this is work where we'll be looking at the transmission coefficient in the differential mode and in the common mode. And I will be explaining how we do set this up uh, as, I, as we go along in this web demo. So this will be uh, the example will, will follow. Uh, I can eventually, uh, we can put this reference here uh, for everybody to, to consult if they want to later on. So this is a, a publication in the Microwave and Wireless Components Letters, Volume 19, Number 10, October 2009, entitled Differential, uh, differential Mode, Wideband Pass Filter Micro Line for Ultra Wideband Applications. All right, so uh, the starting point, obviously, to uh, get the simulation done is to uh, capture the model in 3D. Uh, now, the 3D package that we're using is obviously uh, SOLIDWORKS, and the simulation package is HFWORKS. So uh, SOLIDWORKS is, is essentially is now the number one CAD package for uh, PCs, and it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite a powerful tool. It allows you to draw all kinds of structures. And the HFWORKS integrates into it as an add-in. Uh, it, it adds a tab here. Where we do the where we'll be doing the simulation and calculations that we need. Um, the HFWorks is also accessible through the tools uh, where you find the add-ins, and you have uh, many of the commands that you can do are available in this uh, in this uh, menu. Uh, so HFWorks is also gold certified by SolidWorks, which means that the uh, the user interface. Uh, conforms to strict rules by SOLIDWORKS in terms of how we use the SOLIDWORKS windowing system, uh, the, uh, the buttons, the dialogues, all of these things uh, work in a very similar manner to other SOLIDWORKS commands. So uh, once you build your geometry inside SOLIDWORKS, once the geometry is ready, in this case our geometry is called a differential, uh, differential mode wideband pass filter assembly. It's an assembly of different parts. We have the substrate, where we have the printed microstrip lines. We have an air box, which is hidden, which I can uh, show. Okay, so you can see that's, that's my air part on top. And my traces are printed on the structure. Okay. And so essentially what we're interested in is to find out how this structure operates in, in uh, common mode and differential mode, and the common mode and differential mode of the citation. So when we go to uh, HFWorks, uh, would be uh, would have this uh, assembly ready, and we would need to create a simulation or a study. So we call every simulation scenario uh, is a study, and HFWorks comes standard with uh, three modules to allow you to do different types of simulations. Uh, as parameters or scattering parameters, that's the model module of interest for us today. Resonance allows you to look for eigenfrequencies, uh, resonant frequencies, and resonant modes. Uh, and antennas is obviously when you're interested in uh, radiation and antenna parameters, antenna gain, and those kinds of things. So we'll be doing a, uh, an S parameter study. Uh, we, you know, we can call it, you know, uh, filter one or whatever. Uh, then you have the solution parameters. The defaults usually are, are, are what you want. Um, so the multi-core uh, iterative solver is, is the fastest solver that you can uh, use. Uh, if you needed to use an iterative sol, uh, if you need an iterative solver, if you uh, you use iterative solver essentially if you have concerns about size, memory uh, of the problem. So if you have a very large problem that might not fit in memory, uh, you might want to use the iterative solver. Uh, the accuracy is a way to define the element uh, orders that we use, because the HFWorks is based on the finite element technique, 
and the element order allows you to control the accuracy. So normal accuracy is the regular element order, uh, and high accuracy allows you to use a higher element order. Uh, gives you obviously uh, more accurate results, but comes at the cost of increased uh, matrix size. So the, the finite element matrix that we end up with when we use uh, high accuracy increases in size. Parameterization, uh, if you want to parameterize any of the geometry elements of the structure, you can do it there. You can, uh, uh, for three, for S parameters, you need to define ports. So if you wanted to look at the port solution only without going and finding the full 3D solution inside the entire model, you would uh, do skip 3D. Adaptive meshing allows you to uh, run the simulation until the S parameters converge to a certain uh, maximum delta, delta S. So that maximum change in, in the S matrix, in the magnitude of the S matrix, is below a certain level. So if you, if you don't want adaptive meshing, and uh, we'll explain to you that sometimes it's actually not necessary to do adaptive meshing, then you don't turn it on. Uh, next, there is the place where you uh, define your frequency setup. So uh, you can do two types of frequency uh, sweeping, either discrete sweep, where we solve at each frequency point, or you do a fast sweep where we'd actually solve at uh, one or a few points and then extrapolate the results to the rest of the frequency points. Okay, so if you, if you were to do fast sweep, uh, then you can do linear or log uh, distribution of points. And let's say we wanted this one to go from 8 to, to 10 gigahertz, and we want 101 points. And then the step is calculated automatically. So right now, this setup will do one solution at 5.5. That's the mid-range. And then try to get the a remainder of uh, frequency points through uh, a, a, an advanced technique that's called model, uh, model order reduction. So this is essentially uh, what you would do to set up a, uh, a study. You could at any point obviously edit the frequency point and change their values. Uh, if you wanted 1.2 exactly and not 1.18, then you, want, you can control that as well. So once you're satisfied and your problem is pretty much set up, uh, you click OK. Okay, and uh, the HF works will create a, a new simulation study for you. Okay, now this study is not solved yet. Okay, so there are three key steps that we need to complete before we can uh, run the simulation and get the results. The first and obvious one is essentially to define the material properties. Okay, so note here that we have an air box that is there but is hidden, and uh, and then a substrate. So we have essentially two parts for which we need to define materials. Okay. Uh, I'm going to start with the substrate and say apply material to show you how the material library is set up. So this is the default material library. It has a number of different materials, obviously. And you can go ahead and create your own material library as well. Okay. If you click on new material library, you can build materials of, into groups and individual materials uh, the properties. Now, uh, in this case, we wanted the substrate, and we have a bunch of substrates. Most likely, this is a Rogers material. It's essentially Rogers Deroid uh, 5870. So if you select that, it will give you the default parameters. That's the parameters that are supplied by Rogers, uh, 2.33, 0 0.012 loss tangent, and the relative permeability of 1, so it's a non-magnetic. When you apply that, then you see a check mark, and then it shows between parentheses, that's your material. Okay. Now, for the air part, I'm actually going to do it uh, from the favorite materials. I have air because it's something that I use, use frequently, so I can apply air uh, right there with one click. Uh, there are uh, other ways you can apply materials as well, and maybe we can uh, get into those if there are questions later on. But Okay, so this is essentially, at this point, my materials are set and all the parts have uh, material properties and the materials folder has a check mark, so my materials are done. Next, we need to define the boundary conditions, okay? And to do this, I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, show, the, show the air again. 
because essentially what we need to do, and this is where uh, we get into the details of uh, the common and differential mode, is we need to define ports. How are we going to excite this structure? So uh, right now uh, I have two ports. So this uh, this section here, actually this one. Uh, so this plane here is essentially this is where we have port one, this section here, and the other port is going to be port two. So uh, to do that, so we're going to go and pick port. Okay. And you're going to pick these surfaces that make up this first port. And we can preview it to make sure that we got the right surface. So we know that that is our port. That's port 1. And obviously, for this port, we want it to be a differential port. When we say differential, in other words, it will automatically it means that this structure, this port, will support differential mode and common mode. And by default, it's going to use a, a, a reference and of 100 ohm for the differential, which is essentially 2 times 50 ohm. And for common mode, it's going to take uh, 25, which is half of 50 ohm. Okay. And so this is essentially uh, pretty much what we need to set up. There are a few other options, what we offer for ports, namely uh, uh, the technique by which we compute the impedance and the way to calibrate the port fields. Uh, so those are uh, more advanced features that we'll not get into today. So now we have one port. Okay, so that's the entry port. The software knows that it's going to look for differential mode there and common mode. We need to do the same thing for port two. Okay, so we need to turn the structure, pick the surface, and this surface again we can preview it to make sure we got it right. And we say this is differential. We keep the same references. And that pretty much. Okay. So this is my port two. My port two has been defined. So right now I have two ports for this structure: an entry port, an exit port. Uh, you can, by the way, you can at any point uh, rename these and you know uh, call them entry and exit uh, as at will, obviously. All right. So those are uh, those are the first. Uh, uh, you need. Uh, Materials, boundary conditions. Now, my boundary conditions are not yet done. Okay, so let me go ahead and hide the air once more because I want to go and essentially define uh, these. Uh, this plane here, we're going to say that that plane is going to be a perfect electroconductor. That's a PVC plane. Okay, I can again, I can preview it. You see that is the right one, so that's correct, and that's my PVC plane. Now for the for these conductors, okay, we're going to apply a, a boundary condition that's called signal. Okay. So we want one of them to be positive, positive signal. Okay. So we can say it then positive, and we put one volt there. Okay. And we're going to put the second one where we're going to put the second signal and we're going to put that negative. And we're going to put a negative one here. And this will be the second conductor here. Now, the combination of positive, negative, and perfect electric conductor and the fact that my ports are differential uh, allows the software to uh, figure out that we need to do a differential mode excitation and the common mode ex excitation and compute the S parameters for those. Okay. Uh, so the next step is obviously the last step is to, uh, before we run the, uh, the problem, is to do meshing. Earlier I mentioned that uh, we might not need to do uh, adaptive meshing because uh, the preferred way that we recommend to use the software is essentially to uh, to apply mesh control. So, what are mesh controls? They are ways to allow us to control the meshing, okay, and make it finer or coarser where we like. So we know that for these kinds of microstrip structures, okay, uh, we need to refine the meshes around the edges. Okay. So right now, what I picked to apply my mesh control, I picked those surfaces, which are the surfaces of the conductor. In reality, 
what I'm interested in is the edges. I need to do fine meshing around the edges. So I picked those faces. I'm going to extract their edges automatically. I extracted all the edges. And I'm going to say that on those edges, I want the mesh size to be, let's say, 0 .0, 0 0.1 millimeter. So that creates a mesh control for me. Okay? I could apply an additional mesh control. Let's say I could say, OK, I want to create a mesh control. Uh, a mesh control. When I apply one, I want to the body, I want this. Okay, I want the substrate material maybe to have a 0 0.6 element size. 0 0.6 millimeter. So I can control the meshing the way I want. So once we're done with that, then obviously what the next step is say we've controlled our meshing and so on, go and create the mesh, and we can do a finer mesh or a coarser mesh or actually go in and look at these defaults. So the default element size everywhere else is going to be about millimeter and a half, and uh, in, in, in those areas where I requested the denser meshing, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be much smaller. Okay. So I'm not going to actually go ahead and do the meshing. It might take a little bit of time. So these are the three steps. Okay, and uh, once we're done, the next, uh, the final one is to run to launch the uh, the simulation. We would click run. So I've already done this on study one here. So I can show you that we have these positive and negative signals. I have a perfect electric conductor, which is a ground port one and port two that we define. Uh, the meshing we've done, so we can I can go ahead and just show the mesh here. So we have the mesh controls. It's finer near the edges and in this uh, microsphere, coarser elsewhere. Uh, and basically, the only difference between these two studies is this one has this folder that's called results. So this one I've run, and that generated the results for it. So once the uh, the run completes. We have these these results, which are essentially grouped in different folders. The electrical parameters are where, where you're going to get your S parameters, impedance parameters, uh, circuit parameters that you might be interested in would be under electrical parameters. The electric field plots, 3D and 2D electric field plots, will be under the uh, electric field. The magnetic field plots would be under magnetic field. And the port results would be under port fields. So let's check out the uh, electric parameters. Okay. So the electric parameters can be accessible through. Uh, they can be accessible through a, a results table. Okay. In this case, uh, I have all the frequencies that I've requested, and I have this frequency. This is my expansion frequency, the frequency of which I solved uh, the discrete solution. And I can see that if port 1 is excited in differential mode, OK, and I'm looking at the reflected wave in port 1 in differential mode, well, at 5 gigahertz, I have about 7 dB return loss. If I accept port 1 in differential mode and look how much is coming out in common mode, well, that's a big, pretty big isolation. Very little is minus 57 dB, okay. and so on and so forth. So that's where your uh, tabular data comes in, you can look at it in generalized, you can renormalize this data to a reference impedance, you can look at the port results, look at the impedance of the ports, you can look at VSWR, all of these are available in the results table section. Okay. By the way, you can actually uh, create a circuit parameter table, you want just a table of the differential, uh, S11 differential differential, you can add that and create a table, and that would be just one table for that individual parameter. So, so the results table is a summary of everything. You can create individual tables at will as you like. So by the way, uh, if there are questions uh, as we go along, please feel free to type them in the, uh, in the, chat, in the chat box, and uh, we'll get to them uh, hopefully as, as we go along. Right, so the next step 
uh, for one, obviously, I'm interested in, in looking at the S parameters and the curves. Like as, I, as we can see in this paper, so we're expecting to look for some kind of a frequency response in the transmission coefficient uh, of S21 and uh, in differential, differential, and common, common. So that, those are the kinds of things we'd be interested in. So the, the way we do that is we go and create 2D plots. Uh, we pick the study, so we have uh, one study that is solved, or we want S parameters, we can put the other parameters to plot, and in this case, we have all the different combination of uh, S parameters. So, uh, the first one is the port 1 is excited in differential mode, and we're looking for reflection at port 1 in differential mode. So, that's, this would be S11 differential differential. This would be S11 differential common, and so on and so forth. So at any time, you can add, you know, individual uh, curves, okay, you can pick which curve you want, and you keep adding them, and once you're done, okay, you can just plot that data, and it will generate a plot that looks like this. So this is a combination of uh, one, one, one differential differential, and one, two uh, common common. So in this case, in, in my case, I'm actually, uh, I, I went ahead and plotted, this is the, the S11 differential differential by itself, okay? And we see that we have a, a pretty good match for this structure between 4 and 7 gigahertz, and that's essentially the design frequency of interest. So this, uh, in that mode, it's, uh, uh, we look at the transmission coefficient, and this is, uh, as expected, it's a filter, so over the same band, I have a pretty good transmission over that band. Okay. Uh, if I put these curves together uh, and I look at S21, in, in, uh, so I superpose this curve where I look at what's the transmission in, in the differential mode and the common mode. I can see that the common mode is pretty well rejected because these are two transmission coefficients. So in the past band, I have very little common mode going and this is essentially the kinds of things that we want to do. Uh, so one word about this 2D plotter is that uh, obviously you can control uh, any all aspects of, of this curve in terms of uh, how you render and how you, you play with the thickness of lines and colors and all of that stuff. And you can also look at listing of your data. And you know you can uh, browse this data in a listing format. You can obviously drop uh, drop a marker at any point. You just try to click and add marker to the point you want. Uh, so we can do quite a bit of things uh, with this 2D plotter, obviously. Okay. So uh, again, you can do plots in Smith chart uh, in addition to rectangular plots, and you can generate as many of these curves as, as you wish. Okay. So my last uh, uh, piece of uh, demo is essentially uh, we look at the, the, uh, the field solution in 3D. So I'm going to go ahead and the, the process is you go into a 3D field plot. You pick the component. In this case, one of the resultant electric field uh, in volts per meter. And we can do an in vector or fringe. I'm going to pick vector uh, format. And then you can exclude the, or ignore the X component of this vector or any of the Y or the Z component. I'm going to keep everything. I have frequency. I've got the, the center frequency of 5 gigahertz. And I'm going to plot this. And here, the excited mode is mode 1, which is the differential mode. Okay. So if I click OK, it's going to be, OK, I'm going to call this vector uh, differential differential. So I'm exciting, essentially looking at the differential mode. So now you can see okay, how this uh, mode is excited. And you can actually look at the field plots. We can zoom in. We can animate this plot and see how this, uh, uh, in the pass band, 5 gigahertz is in the pass band, and how the transmission is going through. Okay. Uh, you can obviously do this, the same thing, the same type of plot, but you can see it in, in, a, in fringe format. By the way, we're hiding the air so that we can see uh, through the structure how the field is, is propagating. And then if I, uh, if I, and I made this, then I can see how it's, it's going. Uh, and that's pretty much similar to what I've seen in vector format. 
Uh, you can do the similar thing. You can plot the common mode, and you can see that the common mode is pretty much rejected. Uh, and you can actually, if, if, if you, uh, a number of other options that you have. So if you wanted to do this one, if you wanted to do some section clipping, for example, uh, then you can uh, play with the generate a section, maybe plot the section only, and then you can place your section at any level in the mode that you wish. So right now I'm looking at the middle, I'm in the middle of my uh, substrate. Uh, I can actually uh, hide these things, so I can look at the section only. I can add an additional section in an orthogonal plane. So that's my second uh, section. So I can move these planes around, obviously, uh, uh, the way I want. And you can go up to you know, multiple sections, up to six sections, I believe. So you can see that I have a section here. That's my section. And uh, this other one here that I can move around as well. Or I can put at the port entry. So this is essentially showing you that you can essentially study the results at will. So that's one way of looking at this. You can also do a, a similar plot. And uh, I want to show you uh, the isoclipping feature. So you can actually go ahead and just blow, uh, plot the ISO surfaces. And you can play with the level of the ISO surface that you're looking at. You can add additional ISO surfaces. You can multi-layer multiple ISO surfaces again. Again, and obviously any of these plots you can animate uh, the same way that you animate the other plots. So uh, you can study what's happening to your fields. Uh, my uh, my very last uh, piece of information is a feature that could be quite useful. Is essentially the report generator. So uh, once you've generated all your data, okay, we didn't do anything with magnetic field, but it's very simple. But let's say you've done all the plots you want and uh, you want to capture that data. You can go ahead and uh, just generate a word report. Uh, by default, it has all these sections. You can add or remove or, uh, any section you want. And you can uh, essentially uh, put it in Word. And you have the option to show this report inside SolidWorks or outside. So let's keep it inside. Hit OK. And when you do OK, it's going to go ahead and essentially uh, capture all these figures, and it will put them in one single Word file uh, without doing any uh, cutting and pasting and, and any of those things. Okay. So it's working. So this is a this is now you see in Word, it's inside of SolidWorks. So it's part of HFWorks in, in this. Uh, and then you can let's uh, control click to the uh, electric field results, for example. And it will take us right to those uh, plots that we generated uh, earlier. Yeah, so, uh, so these are my plots. You are inside Word, so you can do uh, anything uh, you're accustomed to. This is my vector plot. These are my uh, ISO surfaces and so on. So you can uh, edit these figures and play with them and arrange them and add text and uh, as you wish. So the, the model is here. Uh, this is the model. Okay, And I can uh, hide the mesh. You see my model. The results are here. This is where you, uh, you see your results. And the report is here. It's all in one environment. And I think that pretty much concludes. Uh, I tried to stay within the time frame that Adam, uh, Adam set out. So about 30 minutes gives you a, a quick idea about the software. And if there are any questions, we'll be happy to, uh, uh, to answer them. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kuki, for that. So uh, we'll take a minute or two for uh, attendees to type in their uh, questions in the dialog box. And we'll take... Uh, We'll answer them accordingly. Uh, meanwhile, I mean, um, again, we're going to be sending uh, a recording of this uh, webinar um, once it is all, I mean, um, uh, uh, ready to go, and uh, people can uh, attendees can relook at it, uh, share it with other, uh, with colleagues, potential clients, and of course, I mean. Um, the best uh, for any further info 
uh, you can always contact EMRocks Inc at www.emrocks.com or send an email to sales at emrocks.com. Okay. I see a question about the uh, boundary conditions and uh, symmetry. Uh, actually, I, uh, I went very quickly over boundary conditions. If we click on this uh, menu, well, you, you can see that we have a number of different boundary conditions, obviously. I talked about this port, which is a, a distributed or a wave port. We have lumpet ports. We can also define lumpet elements. We have the perfect electric and perfect magnetic boundary conditions. And the symmetry question is essentially addressed through these two symmetry boundary conditions. So we could apply uh, electric symmetry boundary condition or, or magnetic symmetry boundary condition uh, to reduce the model size. Uh, but these boundary conditions, we cannot use them with the differential in common. We cannot, uh, they're not quite the same. So uh, we could use them for other types of the regular uh, single-ended uh, modes kind of boundary condition that would work. Uh, there are also a couple of other boundary conditions, essentially, the imperfect. So this is for lossy conductors and resistive surfaces. We have additional uh, boundary conditions there. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, for the materials, uh, yeah, the materials, like I said, uh, you can create your own material libraries, obviously. Uh, there, are, there is also another way, another trick that we uh, recommend. So you can create a material folder. So let's say, let's go to this study, for example. And we're going to go uh, a new material folder. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, I want it to be a new material folder. So this is a new material folder. And let's say we wanted to have, a, we use this, uh, let's say we have a coax cable. We do a lot of coax assemblies. And they're all, I use a lot this uh, uh, polyethylene uh, kind of material. So when I create a folder like that, if I drag, drag and draw a part in it, it automatically gets the bond, uh, that material property. So if this air were also, let's say, were not air with uh, this kind of, uh, of material, I would drag it, drop it there. So I have two materials of, of that nature. So that's, that's the other, uh, another way. Uh, to, to do materials. The exclude materials, by the way, if you had, let's say, an assembly where you had some uh, screws or some, some extra stuff that's not important for the simulation uh, and they were done by a mechanical engineer or something or a designer, you could just drag and drop them. Anything you don't want to include in the study, you just drop it in the exclude folder and it essentially uh, takes it out from the uh, from the simulation. So if I want the air not to be included, uh, I can just uh, uh, drop it in the, uh, the exclude material uh, form. Okay. okay, I see another question from uh, uh, Versa, and it says, can you elaborate your meshing methods? Okay. So uh, the, the meshing, like I said, we have two options here. We can do adaptive meshing for uh, controlled meshing, manual meshing. Now, the meshing that we do, we do uh, tetrahedral meshing. Okay, so uh, these will be four nodes tetrahedral for, for zero order, on the first order element. And for higher order, it's still, still a tetrahedron, but on the mid edges and faces of the element. Okay. So if we look at the, uh, if I look at the mesh here, and by the way, this is another thing that you can uh, you can do with mesh. You can actually uh, you can do uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, let me show the mesh. Okay, and you can do uh, yeah. uh, if, if we de if we do mesh details. Okay. It's going to tell you how many elements you have and the, uh, the element size, the tolerance, and all of that. So in this case, we, we've done this problem with 150,000 uh, elements, roughly. Okay. And uh, so the, the meshing, what we've done, we said, OK, we wanted this. Uh, if I edit my controls here, so uh, edit definition, uh, I've actually wanted 0.3 millimeters. Okay. So in this case, I defined the 0.3 millimeter edge control on these faces. 
so, and I have a, a, a bigger element, if we go into create mesh, my element size everywhere else is one millimeter. Yeah. So, what happens is the mesh is going to create tetrahedra, which are one element, in, uh, one millimeter in size, and then it make a, a smooth transition, as you can see, going from one millimeter to bigger to bigger element. And that is also something that we control in the meshing. So we have this parameter in the options, the growth rate, okay? How, how much growth rate to do. So the bigger that is, the, the, the further it goes out into, uh, from finer to, to, to bigger elements, to coarser elements. Okay? The smaller it is, the, the more abrupt it's going to be. So if you put one, it's just going to try to switch from very small to very large in very short distance, which we don't recommend. So we usually want to have a smooth transition from small to large element size. I hope that answers the question. Okay, let's see if there are any more questions. Um, I don't see any more questions, but we'll just wait a little bit here. Okay, so very good. Seems like, I mean, there are no more questions. For any more questions, please feel free to send them to... Uh, yes, Dr. Maybe to add one. Maybe to add one part of the answer. So this is the mesh plotting. We can do 3D plotting, and you can see the actual element sizes. So you can actually look uh, at your mesh uh, in the volume and on the surface, and it's color-coded. So in this case, as you can see, uh, the smaller element is red, and the larger elements are in... Uh, in blue, and you can see the transition they're going from, uh, and, and you can do like like we do with the other one. You can actually section clip this uh, this plot and uh, look at the at the mesh in section only. So you can actually look at the the mesh in certain planes and so on. So it's a quite a powerful tool. We give a number of options and tools to get very good meshing and to control how we do mesh. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Cook, for that. Uh, so uh, we'd like to thank all the attendees. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, this webinar will be posted on the website. It will be sent to you, the recording. For any further questions, you can address them to sales at tmworks.com, adam at tmworks.com, or hfworks at tmworks.com, and we'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you all. You all have a great I mean, uh, end of the day. Bye-bye now.